And then I had worked for almost eight years with Pugwash. <laughs> so I knew all the top people at UN, but at the same time, they could not cut the corners just because Helena was coming there. <laughs> no. And so my manager sat me down and I still have contact with her actually. And she just said, Helena, you're an entrepreneur. You need to go out and explore how to do all the good things for the world and at the same time be an entrepreneur. So basically you, you follow your, your, your dream. Let's, I want to get to UN, but when you got there, the whole system set up or what you, how it works wasn't really. No, it drove me not case. There were <laughs> big middle-aged white men in the top and uh, all the others were serving them from all over the world. And, and I think for me, that was just a big existential crisis. <laughs> you know, I've done everything that asked for, I've gone to Ivy League, I've studied, I've done blah, blah, blah. But that was also the best uh, lesson for me because she helped me really to find my core yeah. in it. So I actually wrote an email to everybody I knew in Stockholm saying, I haven't been home for a very long time. I have run out of money. Don't like F UN. Uh, do you have any suggestion for jobs? <laughs> 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 and then uh, somebody, uh, quite a few actually, because it was just in the beginning where the IT era started to take off. Uh, a few of them worked in FinTech and they were like, come and talk to us. And I think I had a job within two or three weeks. Yeah, and this was three, am I right? Or My first job was via Pedia. A via Pedia, that's yeah. right. And I had to sit them down because they had this policy that everybody had to code. Otherwise, you were not worth the name. But after three months, I was like, I, I sat down with the MD and I went, you're going to have to fire me or I have to resign because I can't code. That's not my nature. And then he said, what can you do? And I was like, <laughs> I think I'm pretty good at project management. And then that's how it started. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and then I went to Triama and yeah. then OM. Um, uh, yeah, and, but, and, and just, let's, let's just go a little bit shortly in what, what we have you know, in a nutshell, we have been, and in a nutshell, Triama, and then maybe spend a little more time on OM. Yeah. Both of them are just, fin not just, I shouldn't say, fintech companies, great entrepreneurial fintech companies. Vepede uh, used to be quite a small company with 30-ish people, mm -hmm. uh, while Trema was much bigger in size and grew quite much when I was there. And I must say, Trema was really, really the place where I got to experience entrepreneurship, but also customer yeah. experience uh, of everything you did. So I was uh, leading the customer experience, basically. What does the customer think of what we're doing and what? how do we need to transform in order to serve them better? And Trema's core business at this point in time, what's, what, 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 what was the Treasury, Trema offering? Treasury, right? And trading. So I got to go into a very interesting field, paradigm shift. Basically, when we started, it was still paper stocks, mm. you know. Mm. And uh, I was part of, that journey to go from brokering a stock from paper and sending it off to actually brokering through a system solution. And of course, there was so much challenge and so on the way to get there. Uh, but at that, during that period of time, it was still very much in the very beginning of this journey. So they taught me a lot about how to get get all the bits and pieces and what's required to run this kind of business. And then I followed my manager to OM. And, and maybe we should talk more about OM, but, but it's actually quite interesting because you're working now in an era where, where the transition is from almost, as you said, a paper stock to the first data or digital traded stock, so yeah. to speak. So that must have been, you know, how, how, what was the core essence of those kind of projects? You know, you, you well, really need to. I was actually recruited as a sub project manager. And then within six months, I was recruited as the head project manager. And my first job was to harmonize um, Ian Schilda and SAB. And I was 28 at that time. So just the fact that they put me in that position is yeah, but, kind of funny. But let's, let's be a little bit concrete here. Like, so what, what is, what were you harmonizing? And what was the actual project all about? If I it used to be project, exemplifying. Seven countries needed to work as one unit. So virtual office, one virtual office doing uh, a common trading floor for seven countries. And this is because they've had a way to work on it with, with the different flavors, analog, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And now we're putting in the prop. Is this a trema system? System, this is all OM systems. Then we are into OM. This is OM system. So in order to work and use an, a trading system, we really need to 
now get this core technology in place yeah. and get analog processes translated into new ways of working. Yeah. And at that time, they were so skeptical. So they even let me be, you know, uh, I, I was a stand-in trading manager in London for yeah. a while because they were so scared. I cannot take responsibility for anything that goes digital. Um, so, it, it, but again, it's all about people. Yeah. Uh, I know that technology has improved a lot and we can do a lot more. And But still today we have quite a lot of baby problems in the digital era and how fast we're moving about to change but it's again it's really people focusing on the really soft skills and i think maybe this type of experience to be part of when something is truly taken from analog to the first digital approach mm -hmm. i mean like there's no question to anyone involved that it will fundamentally change the way you work. Yeah. So I think to some degrees we have gone backwards yeah. because if you worked on these projects at this point in time, you realize we need to do process re-engineering on of this. Of course. We realize that, okay, you did this manual. It, there's no question that you did it manually before and now we're gonna put it in all our investments on the tech, mm -hmm. a little bit on getting the data right. But then it comes to, okay, how does the people experience this? And, and what, how do they, now we are going from one system to another, but it's actually changing the way we did things. And, and I think, yeah. so but I think also uh, today we do spend too much on the, <laughs> the technique and uh, the digital platforms uh, and we spend too little on the people. But I think today we become so efficient, we have become so divided up that that's the part I find that we have gone a bit backwards, that instead of having everybody in the same room solving the problem uh, with collaboration cross-functionally, this has become the new thing again, something that we did already at that time. And I think that it's not that uh, we don't put focus on the, on the people, it's that we have come into a situation where we point at other people to take care of my management, change management. So, so what you're saying here a little bit is also, th there's a difference here because as we grew more mature, we started to chop up the system and the teams in different parts. So now it, it's a slightly different change management problem. Yeah. That it's, it, th now we need to collect ourselves again to understand the process end to end before it maybe was the simple process, only one process in one system. Yeah. And now we, now that's not the landscape. We have several systems, we have several processes, but in essence now, now we need to get people back together again, end to end and cross-functionally solve yeah. it together. Exactly. I think that we, we, we thought that by making everything a service, and putting IT to become more and more efficient over there. And then we put business development over there. And then we have the people somewhere in the middle. I, I don't think that's the way you solve it. It takes too much time. And I think you need to start solving things together. And if we look at the modern, fast moving companies, and, and maybe I shouldn't use the word modern because you can be modern even if you're an old company, uh, but they really work to solve things together. It, it's super important. They respect the different perspectives yeah. and they try to solve it immediately together. They understand that they need to take that time. And even if you don't take the time, the time will be there anyways, because it takes longer time to drive projects. And if you don't get the management in and be part of that, and both, but I would say also the middle management, we, we have talked a lot about that in the past as well. But we, we need to get the management on all levels to drive it and be the manager of that change. If you think you can outsource change management and coordination and all that, I don't think you're you're getting the results but, that you but, would like. But there, there are several angles to unpack. Uh, so let's do this uh, a little rabbit hole here because we, we are now talking about over these years, we have sort of gone into as you said now, okay, we have IT supply and IT demands. We, we sort of put the tech resources in, in this bucket. Mm -hmm. And then we put the business development people in this bucket. And then over here, we have operations, use people mm -hmm. working in line. Yeah. And all of a sudden now, when we're trying to solve this topic, and if I'm a little bit um, cynical, 
it's almost like uh, the, the, uh, where we are coming from. Sometimes it's almost like waterfall. We started talking to these guys, and then we flip it to these guys, and then we flip it to the, you know from the bis- business to business development to IT or something like that. And and yeah. it some, simply doesn't work. Uh, or no. or and then you said. It depends on what it is, I would say, because if it's re-engineering of your full processes, it definitely does not work. Is but it if, if, if it's something that you have, but in innovation, of course, that can work on the side, but you need to take it in at some yeah. point. But even that I would try to do in the middle of the organization. But I can see that operations people that are run on specific steering and incentive and all that, it's hard for them to take on the new yeah, and, 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 and so one topic then becomes here, and you said it, I think that we think sometimes that we're efficient, we work fast on something, and then we flip it from one side of the room to the, to the next corner and the next corner. Yeah. But in reality, if we would have put ourselves in the room and actually taken the time, locked ourselves away, even if we did it for two days, oh my God, five days, we don't have yeah. the time. Yeah. But in those five days and getting a common understanding for what we're trying to solve, it will, it will, it will cut the, the long tail of this project with 50%. Yes, without a doubt. And, and that's where I think we go wrong. We think that the program manager or a specific person that leads the activity in others, that they, ev- they think that they are also responsible for the change, but they are just facilitating the change. Then it's up to the leader and all the employees and everybody to take on and under really uh, proactively understand what they need to do. And I, and this is harder than it sounds. Yeah, it's, it's very hard. It's very hard to change. And it's very hard to lift your head above the surface when you have a lot to do and to understand it. But, but I, it takes two to tango. Yeah, I, I, and I think, uh, you know, now I'm going a little bit into some of the wordings that we have used, uh, you know, so you, you will follow on what, what I'm talking about here. So, so if you, you, you develop a new service and you know what, and you might have a product owner or business solution owner for that new service. But in order to get value out of that, it's going to be used in a business unit or, 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 you know, an operating unit with people. Yeah. Now the flip side of this, you know, you know, central or service owner, product owner, mm-hmm. We use the word, and I kind of like it, who is the value capture owner? Yeah. You know, and for me, this is the core topic now. Where is the change taking place? In which, in whose P&L, where will this change be collected as yeah. value, right? Yeah. And this is the difference, right? Like you're a program manager, you're a project leader, you're a product owner, yeah. you're coming up with a new service. It's the adoption of the service and the change of how we work and utilize that service that will make them more money or create the value in the end. And I think that's the key difference here that who is now value capture owner, we need to take that accountability. You can, that's the change management you can't give away. No, you can never take it away. And I think that that's really where we misunderstand each other. Yes. uh, So I I think that, oh, so you are the one driving the change, but that's not how it works here. So we have the ones driving the change being almost too agile and let's just do it and don't consider everything. And then we have the ones who's receiving it saying, we need to do this and that and and try to do it the traditional way. So here we try to drive change by being stable, which is impossible. And here we try to drive change by being too agile maybe. So we need to combine these wor- worlds and start to collaborate from the very start. But the way that we have divided up and been running businesses by separating functions is not always allowing for that to occur. So I think uh, we, we, we uh, need to explore, are we going to really lock ourselves into a chamber and not come out until we agree on how to do this? Because we all need the aspects and perspectives on this. So we have the practical people, everyday people that need to solve it. And then we have the visionaries and, and the, the Once again, the different creators. perspectives in the end uh, yeah. to make something useful. But, uh, it, but it dawns on me when we are talking about this right now, we are talking about the context here where we have fairly large enterprises and we have fairly, you know, it, it had made sense to do this division of labor into different teams, right? Mm. So I think also here, this is one, one of the differences when you're working in a startup or scale up environment, it's much easier to have one agenda. It's one mm. team, it's one mm. core business. Mm. So we are now talking about a, an organization where we are driving change that is at least 
of some substantial size that we sort of have the different functions needing to work together. Yeah. You know, so we are putting a context on what we are talking about here, I think is quite important. I agree completely. And I, and I think, it, it, and I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I of course love when we do cross collaboration between the functions and everybody speaks up and we listen and we try to do the best out of it. That environment is so stimulating and fun to be, in. even if it's, it goes really bad sometimes. It's something that gives you energy, not just me, I'm sure everybody else, because you can't, you get this sense of belonging as well, and you do something that's going to get better. But I also think that it's hard to get there because normally in a business, we don't cut out anything for you to do. So we just say that you need to do this as well. And life strikes everybody. You have a family, you have kids that are going to pick up, you get a granny that gets too old, you need to go to a funeral, you need to, you know, you, you have flu, you have everything. And I think that combination of your everyday life, running in on meeting, sitting down for 40 minutes, yeah. your brain is on two or three other meetings and your wife, and then you sit down and it's like, okay, just tell me what I need to do. And then you walk out, you're not really there. And you, you're, and then we get very confused and say, well, you need to get better in communication. Well, it's not just communication. It's actually allowing for everybody to have the change to occur. But I think this is super important because what, what you're saying now, if I use my words, is that if, if I'm working in a line function, operations, I, I'm taking a very simple, concrete example. I'm working with reporting as a business mm. controller, right? You have a very strict, you know, monthly schedule of what you're, you know, someone needs to do the reporting, right? Mm. So, so here it means you have an operational job normally, right? Now, someone needs to perform that. Mm. In order to drive change, there needs to be a redundancy in order to have time to think and do something else while the normal business is in the light is kept open. Yeah. And here we have a challenge. I mean, like, one way we have tried to solve this in the past is has been sort of a little bit like we have the line business, the business over here. Don't disturb them. We're going to run a project over here yeah. and we have a, a complete new, I mean, we're taking yeah. consultants and we, and we even have a project office within our organization. Yeah. The problem I think with that in 2022 is that you, you need this really detailed domain know-how. You actually need a know-how of the data and the data context mm. of this particular mm. process. Yeah. So to run a project where the real, if I'm in quotation mark, the real people who are sort of working every day, they are domain expert who is really needed. Of course. So the, the sort of the product on the side and then flip it in and now you can run with the project. I think that time is over. I think so, so too. So I think now we have the problem that we have line manage, line operations, but there needs to now be redundancy to drive continuous change in projects. And we haven't really calculated on the FTE balance no. in this way. And, and this is really, we have an extreme um, successful history of driving lean. Yes. I mean, extremely successful for some companies. And it's been really make or break. And we are, we're actually really efficient now yeah. in the old process. Yeah. In the old process, we have now cut it down. So we really have perfect amount of staff to do exactly that job. Yeah. So that scalability is but fantastic. It, yeah. Efficiency or, you know, cost per cost per contract, yeah. cost per sale, super efficient. Yeah. But there is no redundancy here to work with innovation. Or, or even to uh, lift your head up to understand how, because if you're going to see innovation or understand new things and everything you need to allow your brain to actually rest and be able to take in that and most people don't get innovative by working so hard that they can't even think uh, it almost stupefies people they become efficient but they they have a problem in thinking new so what happens is that they don't actually going creatively and look at how could we do this even better if we got to do it. Uh, and, and, and at this point, we, we have sort of been talking about what we talk define as first principles. Mm -hmm. First principles, Elon Musk loved that expression. Mm -hmm. It's an Aristotelian philosophy 
topic, you know, go down to the core mechanics of something. What is the core essence of something? And, and Elon Musk puts it the best, you know, his core business model is based on, you know, I'm, I'm taking something and looking at, at the core mechanics and see if I can do it completely different. Mm -hmm. So can we land a rocket, right? Yeah. Rethinking how we think yeah. about rockets or why doesn't electric battery cost 800 kroner per kilowatt hour? Yeah. You know, why can't I do it for 80? I, mm -hmm. I look, you know, so, so that whole idea that we're not only here to improve on the, on the old way, but to rethink it, reinvent it. Yeah. That becomes really, really hard if we don't have the, um, I mean, like this is, I think, where you need I diversity and the time. Yeah, well, you need diversity and time and space, I would say. You need space. Because I think that most people, they're not, they're not bad thinkers. They just never have been allowed to practice and train the thinking of the new. They have been specialized in improving. And that skill is also completely critical and essential for a business to survive, even when you put in the new things, then you need to improve that and see how that's going to go in. Uh, so we, we're going into so many rabbit holes here Im immediately because I think we're talking, um, you're very, talking very close to heart now. Why is this reinvention more important today than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago? And, and let me test an idea on you here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, we've been trying to frame it as uh, understanding innovation pressure. And if, if you go back and, you know, you, you can talk about Moore's law, the exponential, uh, you know, cost of uh, processing power. And then you can talk about Metcalf's law, network effects, you know, and what that means. And then you have Kurzweil's law of accelerating returns. All of them are basically saying that the rate of innovation this rate of technology innovation is exponentially increasing. Mm -hmm. So more slow, it's an exponential mm -hmm. and, and, and our brains have a hard time thinking mm -hmm. exponentially. I, we don't see it. We don't see it. We don't see it. And then it's crazy. Right. No. And We're my, linear. And, and, and my hypothesis in my, that I've been starting to frame together with Mikkel Klingvall and all that has been like, if we are thinking about innovation pressure at this rate, basically to improve on an existing process is basically improving on something that's already obsolete. So the problem becomes, okay, we can chase efficiencies in an old process and I can, yay, I can improve it with 20%. But because I'm stuck in that core, um, you know, core frame, and I'm not reinventing the frame, I, can, I, ca I can't squeeze more than 40 or 50% out of it. And by the way, we've been doing that for 20, 30 years. But if I rethink it, what can I do with data, AI? I can literally reimagining the process and I can 10x it. Yeah, and I think I, 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 I absolutely agree. I mean, uh, technology is exponential, we are linear, so how do we meet that? Yes, well, I think that's your how word. How do we do the combination of that? I think that's... Uh, I, th I remember your slides, you, you yeah. had those. <laughs> no, well, but you I... Say it again, I think it's a, it's a t-shirt here. Yes. Uh, but say it again. Technology moves exponential, but we people think linear. Yes, exactly. And, and if we, and we are going to be a lot of people thinking together, we're still not going to be able to think exponential. So we need to organize ourselves to allow for handling exponential change. Yes. And that's a tricky one because the step into that is extremely costly, both in time, effort, pain, Yes, uh, but also money. Uh, and okay, now why is that costly and painful? What, what, what is the mechanics that needs to happen here? Well, this is at the core, I think. Yeah, I think that the technology as a base costs a lot of money, <laughs> but it's also before you can get the reusability into, for example, data, mm. you need to actually build mm. the Lego pieces and then you're going to have projects to reuse them and reuse them and reuse them. So it's, I would say it's uh, basically the same thing that sets up a new factory. You have to decide what you're going to design and uh, produce, and then you can set up the factory and it takes time before all those routines and people are trained up and you get, uh, uh, some kind of uh, trust in the process to be systematic. And I think that as soon as it becomes data, we, uh, as almost pastor-like, talk about the visionary pictures. But the fact of the matter is that today it might not be so visionary. You need to build your factory first. You need to start to 
produce your Lego pieces and they're not very exciting. They're just, you know, a piece, piece of very logical uh, group together data. And we've done that for tons, but we haven't actually built the data in a way that's reusable. So now it takes so much time before I get to really harvest on the reusability. I, I think this is super important. Let, let me frame it from a couple of different angles so, so, so we can all ex- understand how important what you said right now. So, so one way of saying exactly what you said is that, of course, we have had built systems before. And, but the one aspect has been that we have looked at the data as a byproduct. Yeah. So as it's a, a byproduct. As a byproduct, it's as an exhaust. Yeah. The data is the exhaust that sort of happens because we're running this process, right? Mm-hmm. Now, what you're saying is, you know, data and the algorithm is, are the core mm-hmm. micro pieces of how you can reinvent anything. Mm-hmm. Data, algorithm, software, right? On top mm-hmm. of anything, right? Mm-hmm. So it means, how do we turn everything we do from data as an exhaust byproduct into something that is harvestable and reusable? Yeah. And and now you know to get something that has been done for one purpose, that it can now be reused for another purpose. Now you can start imagining what is the wrapper, what what is the meta layer around this data yeah. that makes it reusable. Mm-hmm. And we have not thought about that before because we have, an, we have a business application centric landscape. We have built a business application for a certain purpose and the data has been in that application for that purpose. Yeah. Even if I take it to a data warehouse in a traditional sense, that's another purpose. It's the reporting purpose. And yeah. now we're talking about Lego pieces that are infinitely reusable. Yeah. And, and I think this now becomes a topic. How do I you know, think big, think about this that is reusability topic you you, you, become, you need to be religious around it you need to be religious but you about can't it. you're not going to have it from the beginning it's going to be a tipping point when you have enough critical mass of, of of lego pieces i think so and i think it's not about how fast you can move in your brain in this or how much you know about it it's about training the organization about that because if you're going to lock in your data the whole time then you're not going to get reusability. If if the data platforms are constantly evolving and changing, you need to have a new mindset that it's okay. <laughs> That's part of the normal business. And I also think that we need to understand that data is not a cool thing that we might use. <laughs> it's actually a complete necessity of steering your business on. Yeah. Uh, but I also think that it's kind of tough because in this area we get a lot of religious people as well (laughs) technology religious (laughs) tree huggers yeah and uh, (laughs) tool huggers yeah (laughs) and the same thing goes there's an expression called jerusalem syndrome people jewish people are not brought up in jerusalem that moves to jerusalem and becomes religious and i think it's not typical for jerusalem it's typical for the world when you get passionate about topic But it it becomes so much visionary uh, versus practicality that uh, if we don't allow ourselves to stretch enough and allow for that to happen, and it will go wrong. But it goes wrong when you set up a factory normally as well. And it goes wrong when you're building a new truck or bus or battery or amp station or whatever it is. Uh, That's how it goes. But we need to stretch ourselves with that it's okay. It will, we will just have to hold on and make sure that we, we build that basics. But the annoying part about that is, of course, that I wish, I wish we could have done that and find a way to do it much, much, much faster. And I think um, learning is a very expensive <laughs> Uh, amount of time and hours and effort and pain, but I'm not sure it's inevitable. We can, it's avoidable, sorry. It, it, it's it, really it, inevitable to, to, to have it there. But I, I do believe also it's, I think I was naive in the beginning thinking as long as we know the recipe, we can run. Yes, well, it's hard to get people. It, well, once we have the people, we need to train them. And once uh, we have the old staff, we need to train them as well. And then we need to allow for the same rhythm to occur because that's normally where it goes wrong. 
I need to do something really quick here. So I do the traditional way because I know how that works. And, and, and to some degree, we are also, you know, learning and building this house or this engine as we as we are moving on it. Yeah. And I think that's that 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 is also a, a topic to sort of, you know, like any startup. I mean, like if, if, if you consider this not a startup but as a reinvention of something, uh, you know, you have to nail it and, and then scale it, you yeah. know, and then you have, I mean, we talked about foundation, we need to have the basics, how we do that we have the, the technology platform in order to start thinking Lego, because mm -hmm. it's not the same, right? No. And then you have the next topic, how do we stabilize? How do we nail it, how this should work? And that's really hard that typically, you would want to be in a vacuum for for a year, yeah. right? And you know, let <laughs> me just two. have let me just nail this down now mm -hmm. and be in a vacuum and let yeah. me be and let these people yeah. be locked in a room. Yeah. And then we can scale it. But in reality, it doesn't work like that. So we have the whole everything going on at the same time and you still need to find the space to nail it sort of. And this is super hard. I think. It, it is hard. And at the same time, a lot of research shows that it's not the best way to just put yourself in a vacuum. We want to do that as human beings. Mm. And I and I think one of my master yes. teachers that we haven't talked about before was Robert Fritz, that I've been really yeah. learning the pattern recognition, how to build structures and and really uh, see people. Um, and, I, and I think that the gift that he always uh, gave to us and I was so frustrated by every single time is that he would push us and push us and push us and push us and we wouldn't feel ready and he would always say but I'm a composer and as a composer every week they would ask you to learn something harder and harder and harder and harder and even if you haven't learned the previous week you have to go harder and then after seven or eight or nine weeks you go back to the first and you can really play that and that's really a technique that's used a lot of among a lot of the music schools and music is really structural it's really mathematical and it reminds a lot on how we need to train <laughs> to get better at what we're doing but but um you 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 came into and let's go here now <laughs> you, you you mentioned uh, robert fritz and you've been at robert fritz uh, institute for senior management training and stuff like mm -hmm. that could you could you use Frame a little bit what that is all about and that journey. I think I, I think even you did. You, I was a coaching subject for you at one point. Yeah, <laughs> you remember? Thank you for that for my is training. That, is that fifteen years ago? I think it's twenty. Twenty. So I was um, introduced to Robert Fritz's work when I was twenty six, twenty seven, some something around that, and I um, really among the economic schools. I'm a structuralist and a systematic structuralist. So for me, that was really the essence. And since I was part of peace and security and building think tanks, for me, it was all about mediation and getting people on the same spot. People think that means that we're all always good friends, <laughs> but it really doesn't. It just means that people, I invite people to have the right conversations so they can land on some topics and be together and try to form the future together. But uh, Robert has really taught me to see beyond what people say and really analyze what they do. Mm. And same thing for organizations. They will say they do one thing, but they'll do it with something completely different. And change is really that. We think by whipping people's asses that they will go faster, but normally they don't go faster. People do it short term, but mid term and long term, it, it's does not build energy and uh, more focus and all so that. So the sustainability of the change that it will last. Yeah. And how, and also how to see and, and learn how people are. And, and, and people think I use it to judge people or, but I don't, I just want to know how people work. And does that mean that I always have that muscle on or that ear on? No, it doesn't. I, I can coach people really quick these days because I'm fast at seeing people's patterns and see how they think about themselves because that's normally what plays out in a conflict. Mm. Uh, but I don't, I have to turn that on and say, now I do it. Otherwise it's off, completely off. But it, it has uh, taught me also to realize that a lot of things that happens around you is not personal. The way people are treating you, even when people are treating you really bad or they're, they're being an, an, almost an asshole to you, it, it's normally never personal. And that's something that helped me 
to hold on when I'm in change because people in change, whether it's personal or it's uh, in businesses, are normally not that nice when they're in change. They get stressed out. They think you're pushing all the wrong buttons. They need to do things in in um, in a pace that they're not I- aligned with. And by recognizing where they are at, both in a change journey and in a in a pattern, then I I can see that. Um, the, the, but it's also a curse because these days I can nail somebody's uh, pattern really quick. Doesn't mean I can do something about it doesn't give me like a manipulative power of changing you. It just means that I know the pattern that they're in. Um, it also means that um, uh, I, I can put things together when I see it's dis- dysfunctional. I have a better eye for that today than I had 20 years ago. But it's also having a toolbox, you know, a little bit like... Um uh i guess when you're coaching and um, when you get into coaching and and and, and these kind of topics it, it gives you a toolbox also to okay if i better understand where we are or why we have this problem it, it becomes more easy to you know objectively apply the right measures you yes. know, in terms of okay okay we really need to this is not the time to push this is the time to discuss so this is the time to push and, and well yeah it does but th- that's where my uh high mentor in this uh, in on the swedish grand martin he always says that i'm like a fakir mm-hmm. i don't have any patience naturally which is true in my nature i'm not very patient as a person but I have learned how to sit on my nails quietly and wait. <laughs> a bit too good sometimes. So I need to turn that off. I need to, I've learned how to turn it on. Now I need to turn it off more efficiently yeah. and leave sometimes and not do it. But I think that, um, I think it's different that you, you can see it, but there's only a certain amount of time you can use it as well, which is also quite frustrating because you can never be king in your own house no it's like your own if you go home to your wife or your (laughs) husband or your kids they they're always going to nail you on something you know Uh, and 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 that's how it works with this as well i mean it's really for me Uh, but i love and i miss always when i'm in a big change like this which is one of my best uh, skills is also analyzing companies that's why i worked within incubation for so long Uh, because that's where I can use and really analyze the owners and what they're after and their passion and then match that to what they're putting into their business. Yeah, I mean, like, there, there are several topics. I mean, I mean, like we haven't even gone to your main uh, career in, in Scania and all that. <laughs> But I think... I have a question though. Yeah. Ah, hello. So I'm, I'm really into this, uh, especially about change and uh, reading people and how they're going to fit in a you know, bigger scope, let's say. My question is like, how to identify positive patterns that will basically influence the, the positive change that you want to get? Because everybody will have their, you know, piece or they will be a part of it. But how do you? No, I think that's a very interesting question. And this is also, I would divide that question into two. So uh, I think everybody has a very positive pattern and a very destructive pattern. And the destructive pattern I wish I could say that it's so complex and enormously complicated that it's hard to solve. But normally we're quite simple human beings. Uh, We we play out our traumas over and over again. If we didn't have active parents, we are seeking active (laughs) parenting everywhere. If we have two active parents, we are seeking freedom everywhere, you know, and all that. Uh, But I think that it plays out the whole time in different stages. And that's, if you were an Indian, as as I lived in India for uh, quite some time when I was younger, they would tell you that that's learnings coming your way until you've learned them enough. And I think that's very smart. Uh, But I think also there's different schools here. If you are very much into NLP and all that, you would take that pattern recognition and try to positively, I don't mean it always negative, but positively manipulate people into doing what you want them to do. Like salespeople are super good at that, or um, I would call them pastors, but visionary people that would do that. But um, in my schooling that I have chosen, uh, I don't ever, uh, I don't want to manipulate people. 
Uh, I really want to see if they can find their own passion and power in it. And sometimes, of course, that doesn't work in a very um, some of the big companies or small ones. <laughs> but I really, um, I really believe I'm utterly in belief. And many people that work beside me don't see that side because I take on different roles. But I think everybody that works for me knows that I'm so passionate about getting out all of the power that you have. Love it. Mm-hmm. And which, um, let's say, behaviors you, you find them as, as positive or in a change? I think that's also... How do you def- identify it? So yeah. Like, okay, you so you can see quite fast if somebody is into change or not. Uh, that's not the problem. But th- there are people that are not into change, but are still doing it because they're so fascinated about creating a result. And then you have the people who really love the process of change. They really utterly love it. And in and me, I'm a mixture of those uh, two. I'm I, I'm a creator. Uh, I cannot not create. That's sort of my nature. I cannot not create. But at the same time, you need to like some of the processes of it because otherwise you kill yourself mm-hmm. slowly inside. So because what you're tough. saying is you need to start understanding the change engine, the change mechanics and the processes that will facilitate change. Yeah. For me, it's harder to stand still than to change. And that's not always good either. I mean, we need all the perspectives. So for change, if you only have people like me, the change will not be good <laughs> because we can't meet other people with that. So you, in change, you really need all the perspectives. You need some of them that's so practical that they will tell you, well, I don't believe in this. You have to say it differently or you have to go this way because otherwise you're missing the majority of the people. And I think that's, that's sort of, so what I'm looking at in people is uh, stamina, resilience, but also uh, um, interesting and curious in a conversation that a no is not always a bad thing. It's maybe the first time you get the conversation with that person to talk about why we're doing the change. And I think that's that's a tricky part. That I, I, In my early years, I would recruit people that were, of course, just like me. <laughs> maybe not the same background, but definitely always on and very passionate about the change and da-da-da. But we, we really need... Uh, we need the sharks, we need the innovators, we need the the people who will always want to work according to a process and just be there and be very safe. And and that's the tricky part. Uh, and I think the, the larger organization, the more uh, diverse your teams needs to be. And I think for me, I need my opposite to help me. Otherwise, it will be too pushy and too too challenging for people around me. You said something. You you work a little bit with uh, with sweat capital and 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 mm. uh, incubators and startups. Yeah. What, what was that period all about? And how do how do you I see? I still do it. Oh yeah, you do. Uh, but I um, do less of it today. But I really like it. Um, our company in Africa uh, went really well. Um, so tell us what is it? Uh, so we started uh, first in Uganda. Um, we wanted to do women's health services, basically apps telling women when to go to doctors and not because uh, most of them never visit a doctor ever. And Uganda is quite unique because uh, when we started there eight years, seven years ago, uh, the average population was twenty three years was twenty year three years old. Really? So that means that you don't have parents, you don't have anyone who tells you or instruct you, you were quite alone. And the same thing goes for Rwanda. Unfortunately, that company was taken by the government, (laughs) which is part of that part of the world. So we redid it and uh, we looked around and the first thing that we could do was to really uh, build a platform that would give cheaper restaurant visits or run campaigns. So it was really a platform to meet both distributors with the consumers and the restaurants in the middle. And then we merged with a company called Eat Out, very big uh, around the, uh, Africa. But then in the pandemic, it was illegal to go to restaurants. So uh, it's not been going very well at all for us in that sense. But in um, Kenya, we, we were basically the white guide. And uh, we, we really built that company up. Uh, quite hard, tough market, but it's been uh, my best MBA ever. 
But what's the context? It's still alive. Here? But what's the context here that uh, you've had in a lot of um, startup uh, in? What was the what's the situ- context? Of the context in, was in that I started out by being a senior advisor and a mentor to um, an incubator in Uganda. So this is so basically an incubator that is has its residency and home in, in Africa. Yeah, but sponsored by all the major universities and some of the equity companies in Sweden. Okay. And uh, one of the women there, a very cool lady, uh, Iliana, called me up and asked if I wanted to be a mentor. And I couldn't say no, I didn't have mm-hmm. time, but I couldn't say no, because she was absolutely amazing. I learned so much from her as well. And then after a while, when she was done there, she called me up and said, I want to create my own company. I want to stay here in Uganda for a while. And uh, she just got back uh, last year, actually, to Sweden. Um, but we, so she started to build and I uh, came in as a co-founder with her, with my experience and uh, helped her. But it was really Iliana being on the ground building. I, I had an, an ambition to go down and be part of that, but couldn't for family reasons that happened. Um, unfortunate events, but I've been part of that company, um, uh, working every single week, the first three and a half years, uh, being online and, uh, <laughs> coaching and went down there of course as well. But, um, but it really was a pis- possibility to build something from scratch, learning how to put together marketing strategies, really reach the social agenda, uh, see how you can work with cross companies and, It, it was very much putting yourself out there on invention, tearing your hair many days, you know, but keep on going, keep on going, keep on going, and then find the right platform for that. So, and 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 what was your learning? I mean, there's so many different angles here. I'm like learning, so you know, doing startup in Africa. Yeah. Uh, any any thoughts about that? And learnings, you know, from this type of process. It's um, it's completely different. I mean, I I knew because I lived in India. I've worked uh, in Middle East, and I've still been been to all these hard company uh, countries. But when you run a com- company in a country like that, you're gonna run into so many practical things that you didn't think existed. Mm-hmm. It can be anything from, well, the president taking your company <laughs> <laughs> to. Um, All of a sudden, um, you don't have a bank who can res- take on the cash uh, they, because they have uh, an investigation to um, how do you recruit uh, people uh, that has never been programmed before to start programming to um, uh, it's everything. How do you uh, sell your product to, to people that don't, they have four phones, but they don't have a computer. But it, yeah. but it sounds like, I mean, like, you, you, wow, that, that, this is a, a this is a hard uh, win yeah, that, in many ways. You, you really have to so learn to how be, to jump over all the obstacles. <laughs> and, 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 but what's, why do we do it then? Or why do you, did you do it in, or, I mean, uh, someone else would say, oh, I don't do a business in Africa. Don't do this. It's too hard. So what, why do you flip it? And why did you see this as an opportunity? Well, I think my personal, I really like complex uh challenges. <laughs> But I think also I I had worked so many years within fintech and the regulatory frameworks just increased and increased and increased and increased. And sometimes that drives me nuts. But <laughs> a lot of times it's really for the good as well. So I can see that. Uh, but it was a, an opportunity to do an e-commerce companies in a less complex uh, uh, framework uh, and to be able to run At the same time, I learned that we needed to jump over so many things. Uh, but I, I, I just, uh, I actually never thought I would do it. I, Ileana uh, is a fantastic entrepreneur and I got to be part of that journey. Uh, very practical, hands-on as well, but also. But it, but it is, I guess, really exciting. I mean, like to, to, uh, to walk in and do business or digital in in. You can use the word green field versus a more oh. mature yeah. market. I mean, like it has a different set of opportunities and challenges. Of course. And you, you get to do them all. So yeah. you get to know every single part of being in business from recruiting to marketing yeah. to everything. So for me, it was 
extreme learning. And I know that people, it's kind of hard to tell people, but I mean, we have put in so much social marketing and media and everything. So you get to explore areas you normally wouldn't explore. So that was, I think it's fantastic. I just love that entrepreneurial uh, energy. And in that. It, it, could you could you maybe distill out what, what, what sort of your key lessons learned or something that sort of you from this experience yeah. and been working on that that you could actually apply or have you as part of you now? Uh, so I think that it taught me more than anything that it's all about the people. Hmm. <laughs> Again, <laughs> number two, it's all about being good with cash flow. Cash flow, yeah. If you don't know how to do cash flow, you can't run your business. It doesn't matter what you do. You cash flow is all. And you need to team up with a diverse team. So get the venture capital in, get uh, get people that really understands the business, but also people that can open the door. Um, and, and that combination of how you put together a good board for an uh, innovative company like that is absolutely key. And I have that in me every single time. Mm. And I built 300 companies in Sweden. Two of them went well, and one went completely the other way. But I learned equally much on the one that that went bad. I think I learned even more on no, that one. And which one is, uh, if you example, one of the ones that gone a little bit better? Do we know it? Uh, so I helped a super uh, doctor with the nose, throat, and ear with oral, methodical, uh, surgical uh, focus on kids. Mm -hmm. uh, she's very passionate about that, and there were no such thing in, in Sweden. So she called me up and uh, and uh, a colleague of mine and said, I don't know how to run a company you do, but I know how to do this. And she was a star within her field, basically um, loaned everything she had, mm -hmm. put all her money in, and just said, I'm in your hands. <laughs> you have to make this work or I'm out on the street. And, and, and we got that company profitable within one year. And within two years, we were asked, we didn't accept it, but we were asked to be the center of that type of surgical clinic in Sweden and also how you work with kids with speech disabilities. Mm. And to help kids, it was really more of a social company that turned out to be really good. <laughs> And uh, we, um, she has sold it now to the next generation, uh, but it is a big player. They're very, very good at what they're doing. And um, Karolinska is also cooperating with them very closely. So that was super good. It's com something completely different. But then again, people, 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 yeah, people. Exactly. So it's no different. And it's the right person, it's the cash flow. And the right board. Super good advice. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, like we can talk about um, some more topics here, but I, I think right now I, I want to move into Scania. Oh. I think we should do that. We can circle back. I mean, like uh, th th there is an interesting topic around leading consultancies and growing consultancies, but mm -hmm. I think we we, we mm -hmm. skip that we skip for now. That. We skip that right now because I. And then also touching down at M, we skip that as well, because mm -hmm. I really, uh, let's see if we circle back to it, because I want to really explore your experiences in Scania. And, uh, but maybe if you can explain a little bit, like you, you were there in one role and in, 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 in group finance, so to speak, and now you're in somewhere else. So if you can maybe yeah, so just highlight the key roles you, you've been doing. So I had this thing since I've been schooled abroad, worked most of my experience abroad, uh, I had this thing that I wanted to experience Swedish traditional company, basically. And I had not put down any particular company. I just said, one day I will do this. And I got called up by a headhunter who suggested me to at least apply to this role. And I said, no, immediately. I don't <laughs> want to work for a traditional male-oriented <laughs> transportation company, basically. And um, then John said, you know, it's a really good company. They do really good things. Uh, it, it's really premium. I think you should go and talk to them. And I, and I met then um, two people and I absolutely fell in love with them and thought they were 
fantastic. I thought I was going to meet quite slow thinking <laughs> mm -hmm. traditional people and I didn't. I met really fast, smart, um, really dynamic uh, people. And um, I even called up and said that I'm not continuing and they talked me into continuing into the process. And and I don't regret that. I, I, I loved every bit of it. It's been extremely challenging with my personality in a big company, but I think I've learned so much. It's a super professional company. So the first role was to run a um, program office for a big strategic project, but also very hands-on e-invoicing type of project. Uh, I had projects both from the HR department to the finance department uh, to um, also cross over. For yeah, so this market. is in group finance, working with yeah. in the C CFO office to do sort of uh, transform and, and improve operations yep. in uh, of CFO processes. Yeah, basically. And then the other part was uh, we, we ran, like every big company do, we have process centers that we run with outsourcing business as well. Yeah, so one big topic here is also at the, so, you know, so like many do, like how do we put up a global services center somewhere? Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, yeah, so, but that I have done all my life because all, all the harmonization within banks and get them into working into the same. One of the part, one part there is, of course, to do outsourcing centers, sometimes in India, sometimes in locally, mm. just to get efficiencies. Again, the lean thinking about that. And then I uh, got the opportunity to uh, work with financial services and see how we can do a digital strategy and see how we can implement that. Um, and what's your role here? And my role here is being director of transformation and operations, which basically means that I am putting in a repositioning of the digital and making sure that we harmonize and try to see how we can accelerate the digital, but also how we can start working in an ecosystem. We're already there when it comes to a financial services perspective. We're quite unique in that we are in 60 plus countries. So to spread, we are huge <laughs> volume. So, so literally a bank and insurance company that operates in 60 countries in one way. Can you say it like that? Well, I wouldn't put it like that. <laughs> but uh, so we, yes, we are uh, 70, 60, 70% 70 of our flows are in regulated countries. Yes. Yep. And we offer banking solutions to uh, businesses mm -hmm. and, um, but we broke the insurance parts. So okay. we're not an insurance company. So, um, so what's, what's the, you know, how, how to understand the core offering? So uh, the core offering is that we, we um, are uh, lending out money to buy our products. So we, we, but if we would put this nicely, <laughs> we would say that we offer more people to be part of the journey of driving the shift of trans sustainable transportation system. Yeah, and, and because we are very expensive product. It's a premium product and it's normally too expensive for most parties. Uh, so financing is absolutely key in how we allow people to consume our products. Yeah, so we're talking about fleets of trucks or even fleets of buses or even bus systems. Absolutely. And, but most of our com uh, companies, customers are small. So we have both and it's uh, growing the fleet, but uh, the majority of our companies are small transportation companies. So sm transportation companies like, like from one drive, you know, from one to two trucks all the way up to large fleets. Yeah, that absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, a very interesting, it's just like I was part of the paradigm shift of uh, investment banking. Uh, we are in the paradigm shift here of transportation. Oh. So it's also very challenging for us to see how we can meet that. Um, we are, of course, a support service in this. We are not the main product, uh, but we are also a very critical part. And we are contributing on the EBIT, of course. But could, could we take a step back now? And, and you know, what's the mac macro perspective here a little bit about Scania as a company, where, 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 what, what the core business has been? and where the conversation is, what, 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 what's the future of Scania sort of thing. So, so how would you frame <laughs> that? that? That's the 
million dollar question. Isn't it right? Isn't it? <laughs> so that wouldn't be fair that I would try to summarize that in a couple of sentences. But we are. But maybe uh, we uh, are what's a the context and what's the, the problem con- the discussions? Well, we used to sell uh, hardware and we all, all also sell hardware today and earn most of our the, money yeah, yeah. on hardware. And um, we have a world class modular system. We're extremely mm-hmm. proud of that. Um, we are. We have built a very sustainable next generation truck. We are trying to get into as our competitors are the electrical vehicle. So here we come coming from the, the, the truck and 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 the world's most fuel efficient or sustainable combustion engine. Yeah. That, exactly. That is, you, and you have had that sort of green star yeah. for the last 10 years, almost five, you know, so th- the most green Probably combustion more. engine, yeah, right? Exactly. And, and this is really, you know, total cost of ownership around a truck. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. You know, and now here we have now electricity coming in, uh, yeah. uh, you know. Uh, and we are never the first uh, company out. We are never that company, but we, we are uh, closing up, uh, and we we, um, we 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 take pride in good products and services, and we we have to move into vehicle as a service, and see how that can be explored. Our main our main market is of course Europe, but we also need to grow everywhere. Um, and since we are in hundred plus countries, we are very big at, and large at spread as well in the main company. And and this is a paradigm shift where we are going from selling hardware to moving into an ecosystem where customers can be a partner as well. And uh, we are also facing new infrastructure that needs to change. So we need to drive that change to more sustainable transportation. But it also means that it's going to be so much more expensive for everybody to Um, move into that era so we need to find a good way for the consumer to 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 consume and to be able to run their transportational companies with us as a partner i mean like so so i think there are several topics in the transportation paradigm uh transformation that's going on let let me let me try if i if i have understood a little bit like so so one way i've heard someone explain this uh, Scania is going from ICE to ACE. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one dimension of the transformation is ICE, internal combustion engine mm-hmm. business, to ACE, autonomous connected electric. Yeah. So here we have one fundamental paradigm shift in the core infrastructure technology what it is that a, a truck is right mm-hmm. you know from from what we all know as a truck today mm-hmm. to autonomous you know mm-hmm. mind-boggling on its own mm-hmm. but in my opinion that's huge transformation in one way but on top of this we have the fundamental understanding of what is transportation as a service mm-hmm. versus you know so will will someone even own trucks in the in, in, in you know you know we talk about the word aggregators and we talk about how, you know, uh, Scania or the Amazon will sort of sell, you know, uh, transportation points and you have sort of the, the, the dealers or, you know, the, the distributors, the typical, what do you call it, the carriage, the, the normal customer today, you know. So the whole, there are me- so you have ace to ice, huge. And then on top of that, you have the whole ecosystem. You know, this is crazy cool, yeah. crazy difficult to imagine where it's going to go. It is tricky, and I don't think any one of us know how this is this end is going to end or even move into. But we we have a, a fairly good idea. We think we have a super R and D and a very professional sales and marketing and commercial organization. But, 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 but the core topic is, we all know that the core understanding of the core business as it is today is shifting. Yeah. And there, so, so, so there's no sort of, you know, and then we have this huge balancing act that we need to maximize, you know, we, we need to make sure that whatever we're going to invest in for the future needs to come from the business today. Yeah. So this is super hard, right? You need to maximize the business of today yeah. in order to have the funding 
for something different that we don't yeah. really know where it's going to be. No, and I think that it's important to think that that business that we have today will probably never fully disappear. No. But we will add quite a few dimension to how the consumer will consume the products. Yeah. And I and I I'm not sure that we will go all the way at at becoming an Amazon in any sense, but oh. but but I think uh, time will will tell how we will we will move about this. No, but an interesting topic within an ecosystem is that there are, there are a couple of different ecosystem positions you can take. Yeah. Someone is the platform, someone is, you know, so you you can, you you are participating in an ecosystem. Now, yeah. in what way should we participate becomes a really core question, I guess. Yeah, and I think for us, it's not that one dimensional black and no, white exactly. because we are in exactly. over 100 countries. So all of that co- adds a dimension of complexity and and we will probably take all of the those positions but in different markets we also ah, have a very different type of applications yes we are heavy trucks uh, everybody says oh so are you really scared that tesla is going to take over i mean no one knows but we are not right now a competitor to tesla because we're in heavy and they are uh, in small trucks exactly. and, and all that so but but i mean again you can never be comfortable. No. <laughs> you have to be forward leaning and really see what our strategic bets are. And and that's a, a, that's a trick uh, and it's it's equally challenging for everybody <laughs> in the field. Um, but I think that if we have been a lot of standalone company before, like everybody, we need to go in and start to collaborate because just the infrastructure change that we need to build sustainable transportation needs everybody to get in to that and start to collaborate and help all the governments to to start invest into this. So I think this is it's not there is not an easy answer on this at all. But but the, but just the, 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 I think there are some underlying drivers that the better we understand them Mm-hmm. We understand the trajectory, and we can start working towards a, a certain direction. Of course, so, so so data will inevitably be one of our core products. Uh, it has to be right because as soon as we are, if if we can, we all agree upon this is some sort of ecosystem. Yeah. Period. Right. Period. Some, some, you and know, we're already there. We are already there in terms of uh, you know different roles in order to get transport from A to B. Mm. Okay, we can have many different business models. We, you can own your truck, you can lease your truck, and then tomorrow we, we buy sto- transport port. It's an ecosystem, right? Yeah. Then we can immediately understand that in order for to optimize the ecosystem, the different parts of the ex- ecosystem needs to exchange information and data. Yeah. So whatever you like it or not, when you say you, you're going to be an ecosystem, there will be an underlying data and algorithm ecosystem to enable the ecosystem to work. Can we Absolutely. Re- so this is, but I, and I think this is so important to understand, right? Because that I think mean- that, that's important also to understand because that means that we cannot change another company. So if we've been in streamlining and lean business in end to end, this end to end today is going to include so many other providers or partners or stakeholders in that. So data will be the way that we will meet and serve. Now, let me test. I think this, I mean, very similar when I was in Vattenfall, right? The core fundamental shift was from a a value chain that is quite linear from production to to consuming energy. And now you have prosumers, right? Mm -hmm. It also, it becomes, and we have different types. So ecosystem again, right? And one of the I key think people don't really understand the word prosumer, so I think you should explain that. Thank you. So prosumer means um, the consumer becomes the producer when he has energy that he that he sort of has. You know, as soon as you put the solar panel on your roof, uh, theoretically, you, when you have too much, you want you want to push that back and sell that back to the grid. Uh, if you go all the way, uh, the fundamentals of what is called demand response. Uh, how do we balance the grids? Well, we I'm going to borrow energy from my neighbor's Tesla car and it's going to use sort itself out. Mm-hmm. You know, so how can we optimize the grids without 
building too much over capacity, right? Yeah. So, so how can we make smarter use? Yeah. And balancing is a huge problem. So yeah. how can we do local balancing? Oh, we can use each other's Tesla car batteries. It will happen, right? Technically, yeah. it's already doable. Now it's regulation and how to do it. Yeah. Ecosystem. Yeah. Now, I, I talked to, uh, used to be, uh, Jonas that uh, you met up there. We had a really, really interesting conversation right mm-hmm. before this pod today. I want to test this on you. Because when we get to this ecosystem thinking, clearly we need to be able to, in a, in a compliant and, and a good way, share data between different entities that are, you know, sometimes, you know, partners and sometimes, you know, regulators. But you, we, we will need to be able to build and share data. Yeah. Uh, and no for the function of, of the whole ecosystem. And, and it's not m- feasible that someone is going to build the monolithic one operational enterprise. This will be some sort of modular yeah. architecture. Yeah, of course. And and what I realized then, when, when you start thinking ecosystem and modularity, yeah. I've been more and more on a path, this is an hypothesis that's been growing, that even our large enterprises, even if they're internal with one corporate owner, is essentially an ecosystem as well. Yeah. So now we have a legacy systems that are, that are build, being built up, not from an ecosystem point of view, but from business application, full stack doing a tool, doing an application. And here we now, we, when we're now moving into the future type technology we need, instead of having many different types of thinking, how we build our internal systems in this way and we build our external systems in that way, I have an hypothesis that if you take ecosystem thinking the whole way, modularity and it's going to be able to mesh it with each other, you're probably investing in such a way that it both is future proof for, you know, does it need to be, I mean, like my, my core long rant here is a little bit like, if you take ecosystem thinking to the core, maybe you should really think carefully about everything you do from data and algorithms from that perspective. So it's future proof for the, you know, for the wider ecosystem, but actually, you know what, what's, it's going to be very blurry here. What's internal, what is external, what is captive, non-captive we talk about. Yeah. And I think you, you need to divide that question into many dimensions. Yeah, so sorry. I think the dimension of, um, modularity yeah. becomes even more important. This is So if you build the data on the same principle that Scania is professional doing with modularity of their truck and buses. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you can work with all different type of uh, producers, but also consumers. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I also think that, uh, but the relationship that you have, if it's ah. a prosumer <laughs> or if you have any other type of relationship than what you have been used to, that is another question how are you going to set up those where's the where do you draw the line of being a consumer and a producer yeah, and partner ha- you know partner so so we're going to have a much more blurred situation who is customer who is partner yeah who is you know consumer yeah and, and before we used to be very strict with i'm mm. making business with you so you are a vendor and yeah. i am a exactly consumer of that but we we will have a prosumer much, much more but I think we, we're going to have to be very strict on when we are what. Mm. A- and that, that whole uh, will, be a prof- uh, will be a whole new area of uh, professionality that we will have coming in. And I think uh, being partner and consumer and producer and having all those different roles will, will play a part. But I also think that it also means that we are, we are going to be more interested in the services that we supply to each other, uh, but also the hook. How do you produce the hook, the modularity? You can produce one thing, I can produce another thing, but how do you hook them together to make value? Because data, um, in essence, uh, is more interesting from a cross-functional perspective. Uh, So BI, traditional BI, and I know you hate that kind of word, but <laughs> it, it, it's very much like I look at the report. It's like a dead report. You get it out. But the data is so much more interesting if you combine it. So what happens when we combine the way that a customer are using their truck with their purchasing power, with w- what their uh, future customers looks like? What, what does that mean? What kind of truck do you need? What kind of... Um, 
banking services do you need or financial services do you need? So if we combine that, that would be much more interesting. We also know that um, if you combine weather with uh, vehicle as a service, you can predict much more safe how much uptime you get, uh, which means that we need to optimize how the financial and the funding part of that will be. So we need to start not trying to be different perspectives, but trying to engage the perspectives again. So we are back into diversity, into an ecosystem. And, and here now we have diversity in data. Yeah, exactly. That goes into a different context. And what you're highlighting now is in one way, we can talk about intersectional innovation. I'm like, we're finding yeah. new business models in yeah. the intersect between two different yeah. fields, right? And, mm-hmm. in, in, and especially in the ecosystem perspective, the new business models will happen when you combine different things or you rethink how, how, you, how you cut them. And this becomes then super important, as you said, you, you call it the hook. So we have this data, we have this data. Well, to, to create this new business model, new value, they need to be able to be connected and joined and hooked together. And basically you need to be able to take them from their old original purpose mm-hmm. and repurpose them for the new purpose. So Absolutely. And I think the consumers today don't expect the product. They expect the proactivity. They expect you to be able to help them to build their business in the best way. Uh, and I, I and I also they want you to help them. They don't they don't give a damn about what we are offering them. Yes, they do. Of course, they do. That that's not a good way of expressing myself. But they are more interesting to just know that my truck is going to work no matter what. And if something needs to be fixed, you need to come and help me do, out do fixing it. So that proactivity would means that we become even more interlinked in the daily operation of our. Uh, and do, do you think this? is something that is sort of becoming more and more clear now that maybe 50 years ago, I bought a truck. That's what I did, right? Mm. And and the value was the truck. And then I took care of my business myself. And now ultimately we are talking about, you know, we need to understand our customers, customer even, we need to understand Mm. their business model in order to understand how does transportation fit into their business model and therefore what we can service them with is not only that they can buy a truck and then figure out the rest. We have so much data we can provide. We have so many other things that ultimately highlights what's the problem your business is trying to solve and how does transportation fit into that? You know, it's, it's a very different, you know, ball game in my opinion, how we define ourselves and what is our core value. Yeah. And I also think what that the core uh, business is. yeah, and I think that we should not expect our customers to want to become digital savvy. We no. need to make it intuitive and easy for them, but proactive. And, and that's a, that's a tricky part. Uh, and to be able to do that, we need to develop our products and services with our customers to understand yeah. and really go native with them to understand why why they're doing a specific things. Um, in, but do you think it's going to be more services oriented? I mean, like as a service, it goes it's in already. Any- yeah, it is there, isn't it? Well, you so see it in some me- markets, of course, not, but uh, vehicles of service, but repair and maintenance and all that is um, a big business for us already. Yeah. And I think that the, the old style dealers, um, they knew their truck and they could basically open up the hoof and, uh, you know, explain everything to you. The, today, the... The, the sons and daughters or the new uh, owners, they, they're not that interested in that. Um, they they want to run a transportation company and they're really into to making that company as good as it possibly gets. And, and we have so many other, you know, macro drives coming into this that, that will affect how we understand this business. We can talk about circular economy. Yeah. We can talk about sustainability. Yeah. We have, you know, we, we have CO2 rules and regulations and taxes that, yeah. that that will come for sure. So th- so all of a sudden now the playing field is clearly shifting. Yeah. And and probably services is one core direction here. Yeah, it is. Uh, and I think also um knowing who you're doing business with is going to be also on the on the wall with yeah. all the regulatory framework. Yeah. Who are you doing business with? How stable are they? Um how can you support them better? So uh, I think that data is going to be core yeah. at 
keeping a relationship on a good level and knowing what distance you need to have to a customer and how close you can get to a customer. And, and, and let's explore one topic now. I mean, like, so I think people talk about, oh, we, we need to flip this product into a service business. Could you help us educate us a little bit like how important financing becomes in order to flip a, a, an asset type business into a service type business. <laughs> I mean, like, I think for, for, for me, or maybe for, or for you, it's also obvious, but I think to really understand the part, you know, are we finance trucks? Well, that was sort of, uh, for me, I, and I'm putting maybe words in your mouth here, when you sell this, oh, this is an extra add on service. When the service is what we are selling, financing is part of making that happen. Yes, right? yes. Of course. And, and of course, since I come from financial services, yes. I, I have a very warm uh, uh, take on this, of course. Uh, no, but I, I think that um, we, we, we are proud to say that we are, uh, we are delivering really good results uh, when it comes to working close to the commercial. And we, we, we are working so close that we call us the commercial, uh, common commercial. Common commercial, yeah. Operation. And I think that that's the key. We, we are uh, a key player to get more people on to the Scania journey of sustainable transportation. At the same time, um, we need to know that we are supporting everyday salesmen on the work. Yeah. And we are also supporting repair and maintenance yeah. dealers. And we're also supporting... Um, um, uh, governments setting in new bus systems, yes. etc., and and that's really being an enabler of doing that business in a good way. Yeah. So w- yes, we are definitely key. We are an extremely important player, but we are that in alliance with Scania as yeah. a whole. And Scania as a whole is a super cool company where we have a lot of good competences and skill sets, of course. Yeah, but, but I think, uh, I mean, like, so, so in one way, in alliance, but I, I think it, it's even more symbiotic to some degree when, when we come, when we go into a business model as a service. Absolutely, because th- that th- means that we become even a bigger backbone. And it, it, it will be that we need to take on much, 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 much more on our balance sheet that we have ever had. Exactly. And we have uh, been fortunate enough to not having to do that. Uh, but that that's part of the game and we need to solve that puzzle. That's going to be a tough puzzle to solve. And we, we actually don't know exactly how that's going to be done. We are sure it can be done. Uh, but if we are going to own much more ourselves and rent it out, w- we are going to be our consumers and producers <laughs> at the same time. So very, you know, but, but ultimately it will change. Ultimately it will change and it is changing already. So if we now circle back here that, you know, how do you think this affects the way we organize lead, how we understand our different roles in, in top management, middle management and stuff like that, going now into this type of environment that the next five to 10 years will be. I mean, like, because it it is some degree uncertainty. We don't really know exactly how the different things will play out. Uh, We know it's going to go in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. So uh, how how do you understand change and leadership on executive and tactical level in, in relation to this context, so to speak? I think this, this is a super complex question because it has a lot of dimensions to it, but, yeah. but in essence, we're back to diversion, uh, or so diversity. We, we, we as leader must d- lead in very diverse teams from cross-functional and not only cross-functional within your company, but externally as well. Mm. And we, we need to respect that they are a main player and that we, we cannot do everything ourselves. And I think that uh, bringing that element in means that you need to enhance curiosity. You need to see how you can be, 
more explorative and adaptable and agile, as I said from the very beginning. That's like the core competence that we need to get in. So uh, let me challenge you on this. Not not because I, I disagree, but just so I, so I understand this sort of where we are coming from now. And maybe not challenge is the right word, but but because we are saying diverse. Yeah. Why? Because I think that if, if you are all of a sudden going to compete in an ecosystem, you have to organize yourself according to an ecosystem, which means that you're going to have people coming in with a completely different agenda, but you're still going to achieve the same goal. Exactly. So it's back to it's back to the point where we talked about in the beginning, mm. you know, a diverse team is more probable to solve the right problem. Yeah. And I think that, that, that that's really where we need to challenge ourselves. We're not used to steering mm. cross-functionally. We are used to steering in silos. What and do you mean silos? Functionally or like here is, you know, different parts of the organization. What do you mean? Different s- parts of the organization. So D- we, different functions. Yeah. Functions, but also different parts of the organization. So we are very, we always start by introducing ourselves from which function we're from. Mm. And that serves two purposes. One is that you at least know what I'm doing. Yeah. But it also serves the purpose to say that this is where I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah. And that the where I'm doing it is going to be very uninteresting in the future. So it's going to be much less interesting to know where you belong to within the organization. More which goals are you striving or which problems are you here to solve. So you will have more teams that will have assignments to solve. And some of the teams in Skana is already working like that. Some of us are already doing that, but the majority of us are still solving problem. So we, within the company, so we have the company, which is, if you're over 50,000 employees, closer to 60, but uh, then of course the ecosystem within your company is still good, big enough. Then you have the company, the group that we belongs to, Traton, that's an ecosystem in itself. And then you have the play field of, the whole market and we need to be able to play and cooperate and collaborate with all these parties. And I think that that really puts a completely different way of steering into effect. I think there's going to be still people staring very functional because we need that. But I think that all of us in development roles or in sales roles and in, in that type, we, we need to drive more cross-functional leadership. And I think the, the, that also is to organize for scale. Mm-hmm. So you, you cannot just think that, oh, I'm doing this now and that's fine. We need to constantly build fundaments with other parties. How do you do that? That's where the modularization comes in. And I think even if you're professional at doing that in hardware, you now are going to have to translate that into the digital world, but also with people. But why, why does modularity become so important here? I think there are several aspects, but... Yeah, I I think that since we know how to do that in a very professional way, and even being famous for it, uh, being one of the best in the world to do it, I think we need to start to realize that we need to apply the same principles for data. Because in an ecosystem, what we're sharing is data. What we're sharing is money. But in order to know that we're serving the same customers at the same time, Uh, for the same purpose, we need to share the data along so we know that we are where we're at when we're doing it. And I think that data becomes the key element in functioning in an ecosystem. But it also becomes a key element to have the respect for other groups. But I think this is big. I think this is super important because modularity, when we do it in the hardware in the truck, allows us to basically have autonomy and speed within the different parts of the organization and still having interoperability and making the whole track a beautiful mm-hmm. track. Mm-hmm. So, so you can have a roadmap for how you develop your engine on a different cycle than for your chassis, right? Yeah. Now, if we take this core principle to data now, I think you said it, right? The first topic of modularity is basically to build the harvestable and reusable piecemeal Lego pieces, yep. you know, because we, we, we know we need to not only have data as a byproduct, as exhaust, we need to have it mod- modular. And it needs to be safe. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and in order to do this now, this data needs to be modularly 
another reason why it needs to be modular is because you're going to use it in a in a context, as you said, right? The, the real value comes when we're combining things in context. But you know, to try to get everything in one huge, I mean, like. The, the, uh, huge sort of uh, intermingle thing will be too complex to yeah. manage. It's and, an and, 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 complex and basically, to manage. if you think about context and domain, it means that, well, this is one important context, how yeah. we do it, and this is another one. Yeah. And how can one person be expert of all the different contexts in a network? It's impossible. It's impossible. And then you got to the last piece of, in order to have innovation speed, you need to be able to put the frame with a clear goal and have a cross-functional team now working with that module with a very clear focus. Yeah. And so modularity to me in relation to the network uh, or, or, or becomes super important. It's, it's on so many levels. It's on the yeah. data level. Yeah. It's about innovation speed. Absolutely. Uh, you know, so you have autonomy, but interoperable yeah. autonomy. Exactly. Uh, in Skarna, we call it aligned autonomy. Aligned autonomy. That's and I think that's word. super important because we, you can do so many cool collaborative projects where you you do innovation and, and you do all these uh, fun things for the employ, uh, employee. But if we don't have the same goal on what problems we're going to solve and have you know, respect for that your part of this world is this and my part of this world is that, we're never going to work. In a good way. So I think that the partnership and the game of not trying to change you, but rather use your perspective and your skills and strength into uh, a common world and combine that, that's the important thing. So I think being able to lead diverse teams is even more important and also being able to look at the problem and the assignment. So I think that what I o- often get the question when um, from people, and they like, so what do you want to do? What's your passion? What 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 is what is your next step in this? And and to me, it's never about a straight line. I need to go there, and then I need to go there, and then I need to go there. To me, it's an assignment. How interesting is the assignment, and who are the people I'm going to work with? So to me, it's not about uh, so much exactly uh, this assignment or this company or this, I want to see what we're solving together. That's my interest in this. And of course, I would never do that for a company I don't believe. <laughs> nope. And I've stayed at Scania for many, many years <laughs> and that's my longest you, and employment. And Scania so. has so many good things, yeah. you know, for, for lean with the whole company culture, the mm. sustainability mm. focus. Mm. So it's an amazing company. But I mean, as the last couple of minutes now, maybe almost like a more philosophical or macro perspective, yeah. like, you know, can we touch what this change is going to be all about? I mean, like there, there are a couple of key words here, you know, we're going to work in a, in a, some sort of collaborative co-creation mode as uh, I think this is a societal capability, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, uh, we as companies will not be able to do this our own. I mean, like we have already understood it from, yeah. from uh, Scania e- ecosystem, yeah. but what is, can we start, you know, can we feel it? Can we touch? What, what is this change all about? Or, or so I think that if you just look at the new generation coming in that you're employing and or that are graduating from high schools and universities today that are coming into the workplaces, they are all about collaboration and belonging, mm. learning, and development, and also uh, uh, making sure that there's a purpose for them to be there. So that's really, what am I solving in the world? Mm. Who am I there with? And how can I learn new things at all time? This becomes core. This becomes an absolute core. And for many people, that's also, that gets also very challenging because they don't want to think about it that way. We're here, you get this function, you do your function. And we help Scania to get on the way. Whereas... They are. They want to do that too, but they want you to explain why are we here? We're going to solve the and drive the sh- shift of sustainable transportation. How am I uh, fitting into this? You're into this group where we like to drive and do collaboration cross functionally, and we are very cons- we are very good at supporting your development journey, and that that's completely new on the market. But I think. That is a response on an ecosystem. 
So that means that the individualism is in one way increasing in the way that I get more focus on my own development, but in another way, it's even more collectivism that I need to collaborate. So it's a, a it's a sort of a dual sort of this. This is super interesting because there, there are so many. I mean, like you can read so many articles on this and say, "Oh, oh we're going in the wrong way with individualism mm. in many ways," mm. and 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 our our generation Z or yeah. you know they they are completely lost it. And I think to some degree we haven't understood them when we say that because oh. in some ways they are we can look at them as individualist, yeah. but there's a much stronger collectivism and community. In, in the kids, if you understand how to look for it, because they are if diff- you understand how to look for it, but it's not the company always per se; it's the purpose that we exactly. drive. And I think it, that's nothing new for us. We know that we know by research, neuroscience research shows that uh, for you to be somewhat happy, because that's a, a bit of a tricky word. What is happiness? But for you to feel good and be good and all that. To, for you to believe in a higher purpose or good, uh, take a religion, take yoga, uh, believe in um, the relationships you have in your family, whatever. But to believe in a higher purpose is something that triggers yeah. happy hormones in your uh, or enzymes in your, in, in your brain. And I think that says it all. It's just mm. that we are also kids uh, from parents yes. that were brought up yeah. with mothers and fathers that lived during the war with really hard times. And then they become really happy to just succeed. So for, for the people that were brought up uh, in the 40s, 50s, it was just a straight line of growth, basically. Yeah. And even if we had downturns, it still it took them such a big step forward in quality of life. So that was really their purpose. It was so many opportunities. And then our generation, we were sort of whipped to be happy to even get a job and don't say no to your boss and you need to take the opportunities anytime and <laughs> don't be stupid, don't take the opportunity, always say yes. And then our kids come out and they go, why? Exactly. Why am I doing this? Exactly. You have to tell me that, not me. You have to convince me. And I think that we need that perspective into this but, but But if we now trying to have a crystal ball and yeah. trying to be- better shape and understand the future leader. Yeah. So I, I would argue now, we, we, we've been touching it a couple of times. We start here, your leadership needs to have, it's not enough or, you know, it's it's how we clarify the purpose you said and why am I here, who am I working with, what's my purpose? So this is one part of leadership we need to be really good at, right? Yeah. In order to, to, and for me, it, it's not enough to do this on a fluffy level, if I like. So you need to be able to explain that story first on the on the executive level. Then you need to be able to translate and do exactly that on the tactical level and on yeah. the operational level. So so all the way create clarity ar- around the purpose. Because it's it's going to go like that. We, d- we do a high level goal object objective over here. In the end, you, we need to be able to articulate that around the data problem or yeah. the analytical problem. So this articulation of the goal, purpose, objectives, and why we are here. That's and a really interesting uh, part of it, because I think that's the tough thing. It's really how, tough. How do I take that purpose and explain why your role is so, or your function or your doings is so important? And if we miss that, we won't have... Um, employees that are happy about work. Yeah, but 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 let's let's go let's stick on this because this is a couple of t-shirts coming out out, out of this, you know. <laughs> so the first one is sort of like be the goal, yeah. own the goal yeah. and be able to in a fractal way work on it until oh. you get to the lowest granularity in terms of data and all that because you're not going to be able to build digital services if you don't have that. So this is one yeah. topic. Then then you said the next one which I think is profound as well, who am I here working with? Yeah. Now, if I flip that, in all these dimensions, yeah. the team composition yeah. is going to be critical because we talk about diversity, right? Mm-hmm. But we need to be really, really smart now with the, with the minimum amount of investment. You know, how do I need to construct this team for the maximum amount of diversity most bang for buck. You know, what are the team compositions going to be all about? Is it going to be, I need a service designer, I need a, you know, a, a data scientist, or, you know, what do I need? 
that, you know, or diversity team composition, uh, who is a manufacturer versus who is, you know, the different roles yeah. in the ecosystem. So this whole, who am I here with, are we actually in a position to solve the question with the team composition that has been put on this task? I think this becomes super important leadership trait. And to it's this. so hard it's to do so that. It's so hard. And what we're trying to do is to simplify and like, are you a red person or a yellow person or that? And, and I... I I think we're hiding by that. Uh, oh, well, I am a really a blue person. And I think that 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 is so one dimensional way of thinking about people. And it's not even um, it's not even supported by research. No, but I'm like, uh, so we need to see diversity and those dimensions from a completely different perspective. Yeah. When, when, and and, and, it's and if be- we use then traditional methods of saying, well, I take away your name. And your sex, I'm still going to see whether this person comes from a wealthy area because they're going to have summers in Nice and they're going to have schooling uh, in, uh, you know, Stanford and all. So I can tell exactly where they're coming from. So uh, if they, on the other hand, get to apply on other, like almost like a work test. I think that's going to be more fair. Yeah, so we circle back to the, the whole recruitment. And I mean, like, because in, in the context now of the problem that we need to solve and we need to have all the perspectives, we need to then have the team composition right. And it goes in competences and it goes in personality. Who is the shark? Who is the entrepreneur? Who is the sensible guy? But the worst thing about that is today the race of competence is already lost. Because it's really the competence, the people out there that decides where they want to go. So we need to to find new ways of proactively attracting people with the different diverse teams. So that means you can't just go to Handelsberg School and say, oh, do you want to come and work for us? You need to find out where do I get these diverse teams? Because yeah. People are, it's a war out there today. Yeah. And people constantly ask me, but why did you pick that person? Well, in that particular sense, I didn't have any other choice. There's nobody else who want to come and work for that reasonable amount of money. And it, just certain roles, they have tripled in price. Yeah. So, so the question is, how do we get them? I don't know. I, I have asked, we actually done so much experimenting that one of my employers, employees, did I ask that person comes from a completely different background from mine? And I said, if you would go out and find people you want to work with, where would you go? And then they got to bring in people. And that's how I got some of my best employees ever. Yeah, but but so here we had sort of to create the purpose and be able to flip that purpose and goal, translate it to more and more concreteness, to be able to pick the team composition. Now, I think those are much more complex or much more important now than they ever were before. Yeah. Uh, so I think this is... Uh, but can you do it on your own when you only are trying to mirror yourself or no, is you, it I mean, actually a collective thing? It's, it's, it's oh no, interesting because now, if because the core question was, how will the managed leadership change, right? Yeah. Because this topic to solve this is changing leadership that needs to be better at this. But you are now adding not function by function you need to even do this collectively to understand this collectively okay because then you now you put me into the next topic that i think is very very different in times of leadership we are coming from a leadership where you have your kpi and your focus is your function so here we have a functional leadership that is sort of you know your job is to make this function work effectively When we put an ecosystem perspective and harvest and reuse, your leadership role is equally about how do I harvest best practices? How do I accelerate my team by sort of uh, finding what's great out there that is happening in the ecosystem of my company and my partners? And how do I reuse that? So you, you, you go from a leadership that is very much centered looking inwards to a leadership that is actually working, selling and, you know, uh, selling, I have this data product, you can use this. And then 
harvesting from others. You know, do you see the difference? I absolutely see so the difference. So I think this is very, very different in terms of leadership qualities to be part of the community, to, to, to well, like your responsibility becomes the network effects. I absolutely. Not only the team. No. So you absolutely, how can they network? How can I network? And I, I, and I think that then we come down to this. I, I often get the comment, but you need to be on top of the recruitment to your department. And I, and I always answer, I am on top of it, but it's not me doing it because I'm so, otherwise I don't get diversity. So they need to argue, uh, I shouldn't say argue, but at least run their case of who they think should be part of this uh, game. Uh, so so then that becomes the networks of the networks and the networks exactly. of the networks, and they bring in. in. Um, but it, my role then becomes, how do I open people's minds so we don't, because we love to go tribal and say, this yeah. is how I think and that's how you, you we are, we are right and you're wrong, you know. How not do invented I, here. Yeah, <laughs> not invented here. And so, so my role will always be to challenge that. My role will be, I hear you, but have you been curious enough to understand why they're doing what they're doing? But I think to some degree now we, we're getting into different types of metrics and incentives, you mm -hmm. know, because we are steered on fake fixing my KPI. Yeah. And this is great. But what metrics and incentives do I have, which is measuring how much what I created, did I reused? You know, we're talking about opportunity cost. We're talking about marginal yeah. cost. You're not allowed to spend as much money to, you know, go and fish for that data that is already over here. Yeah. We have an obligation to look at marginal cost of reuse. And, and, yeah. and so, and this is a different metric. I think oh, we don't know. It's very different. Then we, but then we're on to steering and, uh, incentives and how we are yeah. doing that. And, and, uh, and I think that we, we, we make people at their best, yeah. but we can also make them stupid by running the wrong metrics on them. Yeah. And, and, or maybe not stupid. That's, that's, I would rephrase myself. They, they, we would make them not be as good at their work no, as sub, they can. You are sub optimizing smart people by running them with the wrong metrics. Yes. And I also think that you are not paying them the respect why we why we've been taking them in. And I think that any, we, if we would ask anyone to call us now, or please call anyone that's ever experienced that they've been taken in on a roll that's just on the piece of paper. That, that turned out to be something else because yeah. the way these incentives and metrics and mandates really worked, what you could actually do with the role as it was described was something else. Yeah. And that's also st steering and leading diverse perspectives. So if, how can you steer those parallel, it might even be three or four parallel business models. How do you steer those? Yeah. And still don't forget the, the engine that breeds you and feeds you, uh, but still slowly take on the new aspects and perspectives. So, so now the, the, the trick question, the chicken and the egg mm. question. Mm. So if we now need to get to a different lead type leadership yep. in order to be ready to take on a, a, a paradigm shift, like what we discussed and all that, can we, is, is it the leadership and sort of working with the mindset that sort of, that we need to start with, or do we actually need to start with the fundamental metrics, incentives and mandates? I mean, like mm -hmm. is, is leadership and culture, uh, the, you know, is, is that a result? of the, you know, the core operating mechanisms that how you steer the company. You know, I, I think this is an iteration. I think, you know, someone needs to start, but you, you cannot only go so far with the new type of leadership until your metrics and incentives and mandates needs to yeah. back it up. Absolutely. I think uh, that that's, we always think that people will go all the extra mile if they don't get the incentive, we don't stay around it and we're not giving no, them the mandate. No, but we're mandates. essentially saying to them, you're slept, we, we are saying with, with our mouths, you know, you should really innovate. Huh? But with our bonus checks and with our, you know, mandates, we are slapping them on the wrist that they're doing Yeah, the well, we stuff. get the early adopters, yeah. but we don't get the, 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 the main users of it. And, and I think that, that, that that's so right. And I think that we are always trying to do the shortcut. Everybody does this. I have never been in a company who doesn't try without changing the mandate 
uh, incentives and steering model. But, and I, I don't I don't think it's ill will here. I, th- I think it's you simply that how we spent enough time to understand what mechanisms and incentives and mandates will mirror the innovative or the, you know, we need cross-functional behavior now. Okay, how do we really measure that and how yeah. do we steer on that? Yeah. No, that, that it is uh, tricky, but I must say that I have I have done seven banking harmonization or mergers mm. and I haven't seen a single one of them being successful until they changed the steering mandate and exactly. incentive. And in one investment bank, um, and I, obviously I'm not allowed to say which one, they changed from individual salaries to group salaries, uh, bonuses. Bonuses. And it changed the culture completely. They started to help each other mm. out. They started to take on each other's tasks when needed. They gave each other much longer vacation time. It was a completely different culture. But but so, so the, you know, it starts with innovative leadership and we want to have that. But if we mm. truly want to cross the chasm, so to speak, mm. you know, doing it at scale, yeah. Uh, you know, we need to change the culture. We, you know, I mean, like it's it's like the innovators, they're running into a black, you know, mm. it, they're working. It's, it's not, we're not accelerating with the innovator. We are holding the innovation back by pulling it back in. And, yeah. and that is the sort of connection to. You're going to lose those people. You're, you're going to have them. no innovation and people are going to get frustrated yeah. because you spent money on things that wasn't worth it. Yeah, but, uh, but how to tackle this? Because this is really tricky, right? Because it means you need to work now on change and leadership at the same time on the very, very top executive level, because who can write the charter, right? We are are literally sometimes, we need to rethink some of the core metrics or core mandates. And then uh, it's really- It's a tricky question. It's a tricky question, It's super tricky. And I think where that goes, where do you change? Yeah. is, Is a million dollar question. But also where do you start changing it? And in what pace do you add on the new? It's also a million yeah. dollar question. And it's very individual to all the markets or uh, specific to... to, to the company's context co- and all this. And all of that company context and uh, type of people you have there and uh, your cultural background uh, on the company, etc. But But I think that uh, once y- you, y- you crack this is, now I cross, mm. you will feel it everywhere in the yeah. company. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think we are doomed that we people are the way we are. It's not until somebody push us <laughs> into the very lonely corner that we start to change. Uh, it, it is it is tricky. I mean, like I mean, like maybe one last question. I mean, like mm-hmm. if if you were sort of take away everything which is sort of theoretical, everything that is in the job description, you know, what what is this stuff that is really, you know practically making change happen you know if you boil it down to the human people you know what, what is your take on or what is your sort of ideas on you know what do we really do when we drive change H- how do we do it you know i have my view on this. yeah of course uh, no but I, I don't know if i have a good enough answer for this uh, so you you might have to challenge me again i think it's very different if you're changing a big company because that's more of a movement. Yes. You need to start a movement. No, 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 this is the point, right? So actually what we are doing in order to get all this stuff to line up, the real work we are doing in a big company, I think is that's, we are starting a movement. Yeah. And I, and I think also moment, it's something like that gets yeah. its own feet. And, and you, you cannot do this cozy, nice and cute and fun all the time. It doesn't work like that. So I think that, it's going to have some hardcore processes that we're going to have to start using and people don't use them in the beginning, but slowly starting to use them. We're going to have start some technical support of that. Uh, then, then we're going to have slowly to add on the steering. And I, and I think for a big company, as we have debated a lot, is really the middle management. Uh, I normally say that you need the bottom and the top at the same time and you need to sort of circle I was going to come to this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Clone. Uh, yeah. I don't know the name of it in English, but we, we, we really need to fetch both sides because uh, Scania, for instance, is run bottom up and you need to respect that. Uh, and that's a, a very um, a spread out company in, in terms of the capillary is everywhere and 
it's corporatized with a lot of it, companies. But now you said another thing, when we really, really drive change, what it's really all about, you said another thing now, you truly need to understand the organizational context yeah. and the and the the heart and the um, soul of the company, right? Yeah. So if I take Scania, we can touch the soul of Scania. It's entrepreneurial, it's decentralized. Yeah. It, we have made yeah. success in such a way. And you need to embrace that beauty that yeah. sort of made Scania great yeah. and, and understand, okay, we want to change some of it now, but the, it, it is so deep, right? So if you don't get into the DNA, you know, how this company feels and works, I think you have a hard time driving change. So this is one thing we do. Yeah, and I think we, we, we need to, we need sometimes not to change too much of the culture, but rather have the culture and see how we can exactly a, and even optimize the culture. But you need to, what I'm saying but is- we need to change way of working. Yeah, you need to change the way of working. I mean, like we, it might be a fundamental transformation. That's not what I'm saying. But in order to succeed with that, a big part of change management is to truly understand the soul and DNA, how this company works, how this company makes decisions, yeah. how we recruit, yeah. how does it work? You know, because yeah. in this context now, it's situational leadership, if you like. How will we now do the transformation? If you get that wrong, if you go in with a central top-down approach in a company that is super decentralized, uh, it will never fly. It, it, will, it will never be fly. It will be dangerous, I would argue. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think we are back to it's all about the people. It's, yeah. but, but it's also about mandate and steering and yeah. pushing and uh, pushing a bit more and pushing a bit more and pushing a bit more. And then, and then you but know we what? cannot take on the change management from the leadership. But then I come back to another way work where you said that when we talk about what we recruit for, grit, yeah. stamina, right? Yeah. So, so leadership in change is also about grit and stamina. You know, what is it that we're doing? We're repeating the same message. We are like a Pampers yeah. commercial. Absolutely. And we are, and we are, and a good advertiser knows how can I say the same message in fifth, exactly the same message but I want to find 50 inspiring different variations yeah. so people can pick it up in different ways. But the core me the core idea is the same. I sell pampers. I, I sell, yeah, of what, course. you know, so this is what we're doing. We're doing grit. We are doing, we are, we are pushing a message. We are finding how to place that message with different agendas in different parts of the organization. But we are relentless if we are thinking to really change something in a large corporation, stick with it. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely I so. agree. And, and and you you as a change manager and you can drive and change and push and, and shove and push a bit more in the beginning, but at some time they need to cross the chasm there too. Yeah. And take on the change and say, Now I'm taking this. Yes. And the day that they do that, that's when we're gonna see the results. And now, and now we come to the, another, you know, um, we are talking about what is really change management all about. That sort of is not in the book, you know, grit, 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 push, push the same message. And now what you said was maybe the last one, how can I get the sec next person in line to own it and passionately take the, you know, not taking accountability, oh, accountability for them to, you know, so we'd, we are playing a, a, a pyramid game. Now we are pushing it to them. Now they have understood it. Now how can they take it into their part, et cetera, et cetera, right? So yeah. you need to get that domino effect. Yeah, you need to get the domino effect. And I and I think you also need to make sure that, that they get the shine, the glory. I mean, yeah, exactly. but, but I, I think that my biggest struggle every day is that people think it can be planned to convenience. That's number one. <laughs> Two, we can do this together and it will just be fun. It's not just going to be fun because people don't like to change. <laughs> and then number three of the bit is really hold on, hold on, hold on. And that doesn't mean that you don't repeat and repeat and bug them and bug them and bug them and bug them. It means that you just have to hold on. And it, it, it's, got, it's bound to go wrong. If you learn how to bike, you're going to fall a lot of times and then you're going to climb up and you're going to continue yeah, biking. But you stick with it. But you stick with it. And I think if you don't stick with it, it's never, ever going to last. And maybe yeah. this is one of the challenges in the big corporate that then comes the next thing and the next thing. Yeah, and, and next and thing and the next manager and the next manager yeah. and the next manager. So the sustainability in an organization is really not 
what we traditional said as a sustainable. Uh, and this is tricky now because if we're doing stuff which is really new, we will fail at points. We will go left and when we should have gone right. And if we are not then safe to fail a little bit and c- get back on the bike, that now we, we kill that and we do something completely different and we we get nowhere because we're starting on from scratch instead of understanding what did what was wrong in what we did is the f- do, should we throw the baby out with the bathwater? Probably not, no. but we do, right? I think that it happens. A lot of people do, and because they expect it to be risk-free, systematically giving exactly what they expected. And the world doesn't look like that. Your marriage don't look like that. Your family doesn't look like that. Your career didn't look like that. And heck, the, the last two years we have had pandemic. We have had wars. We have had people more sick than ever. Uh, not dangerously sick, but still in getting COVID. We have had more flooding than ever. So we've been having to deal with that as well. And then in this world, we are increasing the pace of which we're changing managers and turning management around. So I think that it, it, it is a completely new world of driving change. And if you then all of a sudden the change becomes the stamina in the organization and the sustainability as well, that this is something that we are working for. I think that's the perfect sort of ending game that in the end now we need to have an engine that constantly manages to deal with change and we have the stamina and grip to, to, to get that engine going. I think that's a perfect sort of ending, uh, sort of, we, mm. we are running over time yep. here, and it's too much fun, <laughs> but I'm, 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 we, we need to sort of, uh, I yeah. think we should cut it now. I, I want to ask like, uh, some very basic last questions, you know, what, what is next in your life? Uh, you what know, is next in my life? Yeah. It's, you know, maybe the summer coming up or you know, having <laughs> fun. Um, <clears throat> yes, I'm uh, definitely doing finally another one of my adventures trip this time to Israel. Ooh. So we'll be diving and history and uh, also Tel Aviv is a very vibrant and fun oh. music city. So that would be fun. Uh, also, my son is moving away. I mean, that's a big that's thing. That's a right? big thing for me. That's yeah. like, oh I, sometimes I think it's bigger for me than for him. He's more like, yep, it's going to be fun. I'm going to head to Spain now. Oh, he's going to Spain, right? Yeah. So What's he doing? Uh, just studying Spanish at the University of Granada. Uh, so that will be fun. Um, but I also think that for me, um, I really want to take on more board board jobs, at least one more and see if I can do that in a more innovative sphere. Super cool. Mm. So thank you so much for... I have one more question. You have one more one question. More. <laughs> do you have a good idea for someone you would like to see on this pod? I don't have a specific name. Well, I could possibly have a specific name, actually, because I have a, a lot of my heroes out there that I look on, look to. But I think that it would be super interesting to interview an MD that has done the the whole turnaround of getting annoyed at data and understanding that they need to use it. And I think marketing department has understood that faster than ever because marketing used to be a very much experience based and gut feeling, let's go it this way. And today it's a lot about uh, analytics. And so basically takes. hearing someone who has been in a journey to, to re, you know, being on the pivotal journey, oh, we don't really use data in this way to basically embrace data, but someone who has, you know, is, is the pivot, is the trans- transformation or yeah. where were you? Innovation and transformation. Yeah, I so would some, like to see that. Yeah, very good. You know, and marketing type companies could be. Well, I think thing. somebody like um, Anne Hilenius, uh, currently my mentor, yes. she's super interesting. Anne is good. Um, she's done a lot for digital, both in the private and the public sector, and is now working as innovation manager uh, or driving that company in, globally in Capgemini. I think that there's many cool names out there uh, that that I would definitely like to push for. Super good. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, thank you very much for this session. We thank ran you. over it our two hours a little bit. It goes super <laughs> fast. I'm yeah. Super nice, super, you know, awesome. 
Yeah, thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun and a lot of um, challenging question. Yeah, thank you. But fun. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.